lecturer, at times they don't recognize all the additional fishermen. So they see they have the advantage. When they come around, sometimes they come around at night, maybe not using a single light to do their fish. Or even if we try to signal them or call their attention, nobody will pay attention to us. No one will respond to us. So they will work and not damaging our materials and get what they want to get on the sea. It's a drag net. So when they are dragging, I'm on. And my net is a station net, station one place. So as they are dragging, coming to my direction, I will be signaling them if I see them. Well, so this time we'll leave our net in the water and come on shore. So beyond us in the net, they will come around to their fishing. If I'm bad lucky, they will drag my net. The next morning, if I go there, I will not see one. I will end up losing. The next time, if even I carry another net on that spot, I will not get no catch. Compared to the first time, I will not go and challenge them. They have what uh, equipment they have. So we end up leaving the area. Sometimes we'll go to them, even beg them for eating fish. And see thousands of small small fish are still wasting on the beach. Each of them, each one of it can burn another thousand, but it's there. So the water is getting broke gradually from that catch. So, um, so um, welcome everybody. Um, we're really excited to be here live in Glasgow for a special, um, a special edition from COP26 to Kutelu. Um, welcome to everybody joining us online as well. Um, so for those of you that haven't um, joined a Tukutelu event before, Tukutelu means three stones in Malagasy. Um, it's a Malagasy proverb that talks about the fact that you need more than one person. You need three people to come together in order to hold the pot above the stove. So it's a symbolic of the fact that you need a holistic approach. You need more ideas, more thoughts coming in so that you can build a better solution. Um, so everybody online um, joining through AirMeet, you have the chat function available to you um, and the Q&A box. Um, and you should also have the option to listen in French using Interprefy. If you have any questions on that, please drop a message in the chat um, and the tech team will try and, and sort that out for you. Just a reminder um, that, that this obviously is a public event, so please be kind um, and thoughtful in your comments. We're keen for a lively discussion, um, but please be mindful of, of what you're saying. Um, so we have a few presentations for you today, um, followed by a Q&A session. And then those of you online will move into some breakout sessions. And those of you in the room, we can stay and have a chat and um, talk through the discussions over a drink so we get the better <laughs> option. <laughs> um, great. So we're going to start, having had that lovely video just to set the scene, with another short film, which is a really positive example of how bottom trawl bands can work in practice. So we're going to go to Belize, where 10 years ago they implemented a bottom trawl band within their full EEZ. And this was a collaboration between government, NGO, and the fishing industry, which was supported by Oceana. Um, so a series of videos that are reflections on that ban um, have been recorded and then will be released over the next couple of weeks. But we're going to start now with a, a short taste of uh, a video to show you um, how things could work, maybe in, in a, an ideal world. I grew up on an island. All my life I've been on an island. I think I was one of the first all-girls fisher here in Dangriga because I fished with two of my cousins and that was my part-time job after school. So that's my thing. And I haven't left the sea from then. Basically, myself, I'm a fisherman. I'm original. And um, I have my family with my beautiful wife Veronica and my kids. 
that's what we do for a living, no? My history in fishing, I take it as adventure. That's something I love. I, I, not, I don't think I would change that for anything else. Some of my friends are say, girl, that work that for man, not for lady. You need to stay home and get your nails pretty up. If I stay home and get my nails pretty up in a while, pay me nothing. Well, they used to have a lot of fish, although they used to use the seine. Because one of my mother's uncles used to have a seine, Valencia. Mr. Valencia does have a crew of eight, eight persons, sometimes six. They went um, like four o'clock in the morning to seine. And by six o'clock, these guys are in the market already. They see those are very, very, very well fish. First time I got a key when I'm a 10. Yeah, and I like it. We going to fish it not the first time when I got a key check. But when we got the man tell me um, if I could take the boat out of the lagoon. Yeah, and I drive the boat out of the lagoon, the Agasso Island, but fishing. And I teach all of my leave them about the game. Fuck it, me excited, dog. Uh, I generally in rush. Cartello. Hey, Paul Cartello. I can't stop. From then till now, I can't stop. Well, trailers, when they were here, we, I was still fishing in, um, around here. I was doing fishing. They used to go by jetty and stay there. And they never was used to allow us to go on board. They don't want to see us. See, uh, we don't want, they don't want us to see their catches what they do out there. But then um, when we go on fishing in canoes, you can see a string of seal snappers that they dump. Other fishes that they don't want, they float on top of the sea that the birds, they, they can't even eat. That's what the trawlers they do here. Fish, gets, fish got scarce. Fish got scarce here. My thing about that, they really affected because that was right here in the front. And right here in the front, we have, you say, um, the baras that we have here. And we have the, the dory guys that don't have a skiff like I do. So they get in their little palu canoes and they'll paddle out and fish. But when the trawlers was there, that's the area they were wrecking. And now we have the shrimp certain time in abundance. You can go right there in the water walking and you'll feel them on your feet. And sometimes we go with the cast nets, cast a little and go home and have some nice shrimp. When the trawler was there, you didn't have that. Because everything is in the net, the small, the big, the, the, the lobster, the um, shrimp, the fishes. There's no, um, the net doesn't say, I don't want you stay on that side or take you out. When that comes in that boat, Everything that is, is in the way gets in that net and it's in the boat. Yeah, my family work on fish boat. Dog. We just go on fish boat the time when we just go there. We see hill of fucking shrimp. Shrimp like what hill, what chuck load hill you now. I tell you what chuck whole hill. Wait for there. Then we got a lot of boat. Wait front there, wait front of the tongue, wait by there. Lot, lot of boat. Double cabin, triple cabin. And everybody does have a lot of fish check. Wow. Well, 2010, they just banned me. To me, I, I feel a way because they ban never come here. I don't know which, you know, if they never ban but they ban never check back. So, the trawling, why it was bring paper in the country, dog. It was bring paper, we just catch everything. Everything. They might catch cobia, snapper, all the pecano, they might catch the pecano, the big one, the small one, sea horse. Everything, because anything they wait for the mud check. Now we could find sea horse, wait for the key. Wait for the mango. You don't have to go nowhere, you are finding it there. So when they trial, I used to go up on a, I used to go up on a, um, on a change boat itself, and I see like I say, ah, kind of fish, I say, ah, kind of different, like the squid, um, the small, the snapper, the, from the rock, the corals, they bring up, yeah, the, 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 the um, sea turtles, and so, they, they kill a lot of things, but they kill everything. The weak, yeah, weak and squid.
sets the scene really nicely, I think, for why we're here today. So my name is Sophie Bembo. I'm the head of marine at Fauna and Flora International. Um, and I'm here with you today representing the Transform Bottom Trawling Coalition. Um, so can we get the slides up? So um, yeah, just to talk a little bit more, I guess, about why, why we're here and what we'd like to talk about. Um, we're talking about whether bottom trawling can be part of a zero carbon future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we know, and it is widely recognized, that bottom trawling is an inherently and highly destructive fishing method, but it is completely normalized as a part of our seafood production chain. Um, a recent report came out published um, by the, the Bottom Trawling Coalition, which aims to summarize some of the particular climate impacts of bottom trawling. Um, and if you go to the next slide, there's a really nice infographic that's also in front of you um, if you're here in the room with us. Um, and it pulls up some really quite astonishing statistics. Um, so more than 19 million tons of seafood is landed by trawled products, by trawled fisheries every year. And this is nearly a quarter of all marine landings. And we now know that there is an impact on the climate as a result of this. Trawling is, is disturbing marine sediment. Um, and we're looking to better understand the carbon release from that at the moment. There's a lot of science going into that process. Um, another kind of key output from this report, to my mind, is that the carbon footprint of bottom trawled seafood is high. Um, not quite as high as, as beef for cow, but it is extremely high. And it means that seafood is not always a very kind of environmentally friendly way to eat if you're eating bottom trawled produce. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of um, why, um, so there's another report um, that's coming out in the next couple of weeks, which is looking to be a really sound scientific evidence base on bottom trawling. It's looking to assess the what of trawling, what is it, also where is it, where are the key, key hotspots of trawling that we might want to try and address some solutions around, um, and really also trying to pull out some potential constructive paths forward. So trying to provide some indication of what the solution might be if we're to, tr to transition away from such a, a widely used method. So this led to the launch of the Transform Bottom Trawling Coalition. Uh, this was launched on the 6th of September at the IUCN World Conservation Congress. Um, it's a grouping um, of currently 47 organizations that have come together um, and it's developed um, four main calls to action. These were developed collaboratively um, by feeding out, reaching out to and receiving input from over 120 relevant organizations. Next slide, please. Um, and the four calls to action um, are hopefully fairly <laughs> simple, um, but they are quite ambitious. So firstly, we would look to <coughs> um, expand and strengthen nearshore exclusion zones. Um, for small scale fisheries and move trawling slightly further off the coast. Secondly, we would look to prohibit bottom trawling within marine protected areas. We had the really nice example from Belize, but for example, in the UK, trawling is allowed in more than 95% of our MPAs. So even in the UK, we have a lot of work to do on this issue. Um, and we've got some panelists that will be speaking to exactly that in a moment. Um, the third call to action is around ending subsidies for bottom trawling in particular. Um, there is a lot of research and, and calculations going into this, and it basically indicates that if subsidies were removed, bottom trawling would no longer be profitable. And the fourth call to action is around freezing the footprint. So making sure that if there are pristine or untrawled areas of the seabed out there, that we can stop them being trawled so that we can limit the trawling impact because it's not going to stop tomorrow. There is going to be some kind of transition process if we can make sure that we limit the impact of that as much as we possibly can. And that's all from me in terms of I'm going to invite our first panelist. Um, so I'm really pleased that we're joined by Bally Philps. Um, he is a, a Scottish uh, fisherman. Um, he's also um, the president of the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about your work. Over to you. OK, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a, a full time commercial fisherman fishing with creels off the west coast of Scotland. I come from a family of troll and dredge fishermen. I was the first black sheep in my family to uh, turn my back on trolling and dredging. And uh, hopefully I'm qualified enough to talk about this. I've got some slides here, hopefully. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, uh, I had uh, a troller friend recently asked me 
a question. I do still have a couple of troller friends left. Um, a troller friend asked me a question, why are we singling out trolling and dredging? And I thought I would try and address that. So um, I think you've all probably heard of a recent study about the aviation industry having a similar carbon footprint possibly to the trolling sector. Now that's a disputed study, the figures are disputed, but I think the general consensus is that the, there's a good chance that the carbon footprint of trolling is quite significant. Now, I'm not sure how quick these slides are changing. Okay, so we think if the carbon footprint is even half as significant as these studies are showing, what we could find ourselves is that instead of acting as they have for millennia, that the sea logs of Scotland could, instead of being carbon sinks, be some of our most significant sources of carbon. And I think that's quite a, a significant impact that we could be finding ourselves with. Now, one of the reasons I think this is so important is that Scotland isn't counting its blue carbon. So the carbon that's coming from these trawlers that these studies have been referring to isn't even mentioned in our carbon budgets. And if it turns out that this is the most significant source of carbon in Scotland, or one of the most significant, then that's a, a significant thing not to be counting. Now, one of the reasons this is so significant is that Scotland's sea areas are huge. And the, as was mentioned earlier, the, the trawling footprint is something like the vast majority of this thing's only excluded from a few percent of Scotland's inshore. So again, if, if we're disturbing all of these sediments, then this could be a very big blind spot in our carbon budgets. Now, carbon is estimated to be the majority of the carbon in Scotland. It, it, it's a, it dwarves the terrestrial carbon from all of our peat, our topsoils and our living trees put together. Now, it's worth noting that carbon exists in two principal forms. That's the sort of inorganic carbon, which we're not really going to be talking about here, but mostly what we're interested in is the organic carbon. And that's living things, biogenic reefs and, and the animals and fish that are in the sea, and also the sediments that are in the seabed, which can come from a combination of the living things and being washed down from, from the peat in our hills. Now, one of the things about this carbon is it's quite easily disturbed. And this is one of the mechanisms by which it's disturbed. Now, when we tow gear across the seabed, whether it's dredge or trawl, it not only interacts with the life that's on the seabed, it also interacts with the sediments. And it can have a quite a dramatic impact. I mean, we can remove pretty much all of the life in the same way as, as you might harrow or plough a field, and, uh, and it leaves us only with sediments to be disturbed. Now, this is an interesting map here. It shows where the organic footprint is of, or the organic carbon is, I should say, um, around Scotland's coastline. And you'll notice apart from a, a blob out in the middle of the North Sea and the, the flooding grounds, much of the organic carbon in Scotland sees is in the inshore. Um, up until recently, a lot of this carbon wasn't touched by trawling and dredging because there was an inshore exclusion zone on mobile gear in Scotland. Um, now, there was a study done recently by the Scottish government, so that's this image on the right. And that shows the... Uh, one of the frightening things here is that the disturbance map correlates almost exactly with where the carbon is in Scotland seas. Now it's not an accident. What's happening is that the prawns that the trawlers are targeting live in the mud and so therefore they're disturbing the mud and the, the scallops that the dredgers are seeking are in the, the shallower biogenic reef areas again where we have a lot of our organic carbon. So I think uh, the change in our ecosystem could be quite significant and this maybe illustrates some of the changes that we've seen in our ecosystem. This is a graph showing the demersal fish landing in the Clyde Sea area since 1960. Each colour represents a fish species. Now, each, each fish species has a story of its own to tell, but the important thing to note here is that every fish species story ends the same way. That is commercial extinction by the turn of the century. Now, this is a relatively well-known fact. This is Marine Scotland's own map, Scottish Government's own map. And in 2010, Marine Scotland said that they would do something about this, and, uh, and they undertook to protect what was left and recover. Now, the kind of things that they were looking to protect and recover and weren't just these commercial, commercial fish species, they were also looking to recover and protect the priority marine features in the ecosystem. This is one of these priority marine features. This is a, a flame shell, and, uh, or, and flame shells make up reefs, biogenic reefs, which cover the bottom of the seabed and stabilize the seabed. They also sequester carbon in the process of doing so. Now, unfortunately, since Marine Scotland said that they were going to protect these, these environments, we've lost as much as 50% of our flame shell reefs from Argyle alone. This is a circulid reef. This is one of Scotland's most rare reef environments. We've only got one example of circulid reefs left in the whole of Scotland. Unfortunately, in the time since me and Scotland said they would protect these 
and we cover these kind of environments, we've lost 90% of our circulatory reefs in the highlands alone. And this is a blue mussel bed. Um, in the Moray Firth, we've lost over 90% of our blue mussel bed since Marine Scotland said that they would protect these habitats. Now, the problem with this is this, these figures are quite stark, but they're only the last 10 years. If we go back to pre-trawl pre baselines, then uh, we, have to, uh, we have to imagine the kind of losses that we have had in the time that trawling has been allowed inshore. Now, Marine Scotland and the Scottish Government has committed itself to something called the ecosystems approach, which means that they should be looking at these pre-trawl baselines. And, uh, and so if we take one example here, like seagrass, which is, is very good at sequestering carbon, we've lost something like 90% of our seagrass from the, to the best of our knowledge since pre-trawl baselines. Now, there's an interesting map here, which is the priority marine features that we know of that are left around Scotland's coastline. There's two colours here. So each dot represents a flame shell reef or a seagrass environment or a blue mussel bed or such like. So the green dots are meant to be areas where we have some protection for these priority marine features. And although we should understand that some of that's protection is temporal, which means for two months a year or six months a year. So they're not particularly well protected. The red dots are areas where the priority marine features are not protected at all. And what that means is that you're perfectly entitled, legally entitled to go and dredge and trawl away these features into oblivion tomorrow. This is despite the fact that 10 years ago, Marine Scotland said it was going to undertake to protect and recover these features. Now, it's quite frustrating because if Marine Scotland did what it said it was going to do, then and it looked at these private marine features and included the pre-trawl baselines, what you would have is a, is a continuous zone right around the coastline of Scotland where trawling and dredging wouldn't be allowed. Because to be honest with you, you can't protect these features without prohibiting trawling and dredging where they are. Now, we at the Scottish Keel Fishermen's Federation have been arguing for a lot of years, amongst many others, that if we transition towards low impact fisheries inshore, we could increase employment and revive our coastal communities as well as protect these priority marine features. We're not the only ones arguing this. There are examples of this around the world. This is an example in Lime Bay in, in England where they've excluded trawling and dredging and they're seeing huge increases in employment and revenues and recovery of the ecosystems there. So what we're saying is that one of the biggest contributions that Scotland can make to meet the challenges of the biodiversity and the climate crisis is to introduce with urgency a prohibition on bottom towed fishing gears in Scotland's inshore waters. And the real question that remains is, are the Scottish Government willing to do what they committed themselves to doing 10 years ago? Thank you. Perfectly to time. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Bally. It's fascinating to have that insight from with the industry perspective as well. I think that's really valuable, um, but also slightly stark and very depressing. Um, so now we're going to um, um, hear from Jenny Crockett. So she represents the community of Aran Seabed Trust or Coast. Um, so this is a small Scottish NGO that has been trialling a solution and has implemented a, a marine protected area that has pushed trawling slightly further off the coast. So Jenny, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, hopefully this works. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks Sophie for the introduction. So I run the outreach and communications for the community of Aran Seabed Trust or um, Coast as it's known. And we are a marine conservation charity based on the Isle of Arran. Um, making no presumptions, the Isle of Arran is off the west coast of Scotland and is situated within the Clyde Marie region and the Clyde Sea still. Um, we Historically, the Firth of Clyde was an important fisheries area for Scotland with um, a very well-known herring um, fishery within its seas. Um, but sadly, um, as Bally touched on, um, we witnessed a catastrophic decline from the mid-1980s with the repealing of the 1984 inshore limits. Um, and this decline in our fish species and the destruction of our inshore habitats was witnessed by Coast's co-founders, Howard Wood and Don McNeish. Um, they observed this, they're local scuba divers, no marine, um, you know, they weren't marine biologists, but they just witnessed what was happening and they realised it wasn't right. And they were inspired to protect the rich fishing heritage of their inshore waters for the future generations. And therefore they founded Coast. Um, today, Coast are an education and research charity, and we're also a campaigning body, campaigning for real change in the way Scotland's inshore seas are managed. 
So back in 1995, Howard and Dawn set out to speak to anyone and everyone who would listen about the potential of bringing in a marine reserve into um, waters around Arran. And they were particularly focusing on this area here um, in Lamlash Bay, and they wanted a marine reserve to protect what was there. Um, they worked with, they obviously lobbied government, they worked with a number of different organisations and stakeholders, basically anyone who had a stake in our seas, um, from fishermen to locals to community businesses. Um, and in 2008, Marine Scotland and Nature Scott established the Lamlash Bay No-Take Zone, a 2.67 square kilometre area, um, what does what it says on the tin. You can't extract any marine life from this area. Um, it's the only community-led no-take zone in the UK, and it's the only no-take zone in Scotland. Today, the no-take zone sits within the much wider marine protected area, um, which is a 280 square kilometre area around the south of Arran. Um, scallop dredging is prohibited from the entirety of the marine protected area, and prawn trawling is allowed in three small outside zones. Obviously, the no-take zone remains the no-take zone, and there's a few areas where creel fishing is also prohibited because there's particularly sensitive habitats that are in these areas. Now, the MPA was designated for priority marine features. It's a nature conservation MPA, so it was um, designated for things like merle, seagrass, and burrowed mud. It wasn't designated to protect blue carbon habitats, but a lot of these priority marine features are blue carbon habitats. They retain carbon in their systems um, and help us fight climate change. The ability of blue carbon habitats and ecosystems varies depending on the habitat and the species. Um, Merle is a lovely example. We have live beds of this in our marine, um, in the marine protected area and no take zone. Um, and this seaweed is extremely slow growing. Um, and has a calcium carbonate skeleton. As it grows, it captures carbon um, within its living plant tissues, as well as its hard skeleton. Um, as I say, extremely slow growing, about one millimeter a year, um, but these large merl beds are persistent, and over time they retain the carbon in this deep sediment of merl gravel that they accumulate. And it's estimated in the top 60 centimetres of Scottish merl beds, there's about 448,000 tonnes of carbon that is retained, although experts do say this is probably a gross underestimate. Um, we've got seagrass in our marine protected area. Um, it's suspected to be the largest seagrass meadow in the Firth of Clyde, um, and it's an area that's not just um, protected from bottom fishing, but also from creel fishing um, as well. So both mobile and static fishing. Um, seagrass, blue carbon potential of seagrass is quite an active area of research, um, but we do know that it sequesters carbon at a rate of about 1,000 tonnes a year. The majority of carbon in, in seagrass meadows is actually retained in the sediment, not in the living plants themselves. Um, but the sediment structure and the root structure of seagrass is quite sensitive, so any sort of bottom fishing can destabilise this structure and release carbon back into the water and potentially back into the atmosphere. Kelp is slightly different. Um, kelp plants themselves are short-term carbon stores because every year the new plant is growing and that is where they, they store the carbon. However, the dead and decaying plant from the previous year's growth does sink down to deeper waters um, and this therefore then contributes to the deep water sediment stores um, of carbon. And we know that kelp plants can sequester carbon at a rate of about 1.7 million tonnes per year. So there's a lot of habitats that we're lucky to have in the MPA um, that are helping humans and giving humans the benefit of carbon capture capabilities. But there's lots of other benefits us as humans get from these blue carbon habitats. They provide jobs and income to coastal communities through lots of different recreational opportunities um, and also by supporting fisheries. Um, a lot of these ecosystems are biodiversity powerhouses. They provide nursery habitats for commercially important species as well. And not only that, um, they can provide a form of coastal protection and can improve water quality in the area. Blue carbon ecosystems, though, are under threat. Um, both anthropogenic and natural events 
can severely alter the capability of these ecosystems to store and retain carbon. Um, alarmingly, in a Scottish government scoping report, there were 11 habitats um, identified as being particularly sensitive to bottom contact mobile fishing. Eight of these 11 um, habitats were identified as blue carbon habitats. Um, and it's estimated that around 1.02 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide annually is released from degraded coastal ecosystems from bottom mobile fishing alone. But we can protect these ecosystems. Um, the South Iron Marine protected area and or marine protected areas in general are a way of protecting these ecosystems. Um, it makes economic sense to protect blue carbon. In the UK, carbon sequestration is estimated to be about £57 billion pounds annually. Um, our MPA alone captures around 8,000 tonnes per kilometre squared within, um, within its habitats, um, which totals to around 2.2. 245 million tonnes of carbon in the whole MPA, which is quite staggering. Um, we know MPAs can protect blue carbon ecosystems, but even better would be something like an inshore limit. Blue carbon ecosystems are one of the top nature-based solutions to climate change. And if we um, were to reinstate an inshore limit via just transition to our seas, we would protect the wealth of blue carbon ecosystems Scotland's inshore waters have. Doing this, we'd combat both climate change and biodiversity loss. And that is me. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny. Really nice to have a, an example of how things can work in the in the kind of local context. And I would encourage you all to have a look at that RC's petition and the RC's website for some more information um, on the three nautical mile limit. Um, so now we're going slightly further afield um, and we've got a remote participant hopefully joining us on the screen. Um, so we're very pleased to have Brian O'Rourdon with us. Um, he is the executive sec secretary of the Low Impact Fishers of Europe. Um, so this is an umbrella organization of small of organizations of small scale, low impact European fishers, and it works to provide them with a dedicated voice in policy. So, Brian, hopefully you can hear us. We can see you. Um, so please um, take it away. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Really happy to be here with you. I was really uh, fascinated by those last two presentations, which uh, really showed how enormously uh, valuable but how potentially vulnerable our inshore uh, areas are what a rich diversity of marine life they have in them and how important that diversity is to the sustainability not just of the uh, oceans but of the uh, communities that live around the shore um, i'd just like to start with a disclaimer uh, the low impact fishes of europe um, or, or life, is not anti-trawling. We believe that, um, well, our motto, in fact, is right gear, right time, <clears throat> right place. And there is a time and a place for trawling, but that needs to be defined clearly in uh, inshore and offshore fishing policy. And in most uh, countries, UK and more widely in Europe, we simply have a policy which allows trawling to take place everywhere um, without analysing what is the best place for trawling. And the other flip side of the coin is that the um, smaller scale, lower impact uh, fishing activities, first of all, they couldn't access the deeper waters and the quantities of fish that are brought in by trawling and more intensive uh, fishing activities. But the fact remains that these larger scale, what I would call mass production fishing activities, um, have implications not only for the sustainability of resources, but they have come to provide a component of what are inherently unsustainable uh, food systems which deliver fish products uh, in, in about 80% of the cases through central supply chains to large retail outlets. 
In Europe, nearly four decades of successive common fisheries policies have created a distorted sea that promotes larger scale intensive fishing at the expense of smaller scale, lower impact fishing. And this has implications not only for the environment, but also for food security and the socioeconomic viability of many coastal communities. And the figures speak for themselves. 70% of the European fleet by vessel numbers, which provides 50% of the jobs at sea, are only allowed to catch 5% of what's landed. That's because at every turn, smaller scale, low impact fishing vessels have been discriminated against, both in terms of their access to resources and also in terms of their access to markets. The system used for allocating fishing opportunities in Europe has led to a concentration of fishing opportunities in the hands of relatively few, um, few larger scale companies. And that means that the smaller scale, lower impact fisheries increasingly have to fall back on what are known as non-quota species. They're those species increasingly fewer in number that are not actually subject to quota. As we've seen also, larger scale, more intensive fishing activities encroach on the fishing areas of smaller inshore fishing activities, carrying away their nets and other gears, reducing and damaging the sea blip. In Europe, financial support for implementing the common fisheries policy has been used to provide perverse subsidies for the construction and modernization of larger and more powerful vessels and to innovate fishing equipment so that it's ever more efficient at catching fish. It's something that we call technological creep. And every year, this technological creep is increasing the effectiveness of larger scale fishing operations to catch fish, which means less fish for smaller fishing operations and a need for fewer boats, fewer employment, but increasingly higher concentration of the ownership of the access rights, putting um, at risk a more equitable distribution of the benefits from fishing. The relatively larger catches from the trawling sector also have a depressing effect on prices, undermining the viability of smaller scale enterprises. So smaller scale enterprises, unlike the larger ones, have a relatively low to value added that they make to their fishery product in terms of the very fresh quality of the fish. So we're talking of basically the daily catch the fish is landed daily, it's in very high quality, um, it's caught using traditional methods which are highly selective and it's based on a shared maritime heritage. The fish that you find in the supermarkets generally is from the larger scale sector, it's produced massively and the margins required to make a profit are much less than the margins required to make a profit in the smaller scale sector. So this price depression means that the value addition that the smaller scale sector provide is not recognized or respected. So who are the low impact fishers of Europe? We're a relatively uh, new organization established in 2012 on the eve of the common fishing policy. And the fishers came together in order to achieve a fairer fishery scene, healthy seas, and vibrant communities. We currently have 32 life member organizations from 15 EU member states across all the sea basins, incorporating around 10,000 small scale fishers. Life provides a dedicated voice for its members in the policy making and decision making processes at European level. And such a voice is needed given the bias of European policies 
towards larger scale, more intensive forms of fishing. So we would say that the small scale sector provide the cream of the catch. That's 5% of the catch, which supports 50,000 vessels, 70,000 fishers at sea, providing a very high quality fresh fish and a very large number of jobs ashore. Now, in recent years, the common fishing policy has began to consider the wider aspects and the uh, fisheries policy is very much part of what's called the uh, European Green Deal, which is to uh, provide a carbon neutral Europe by 2050. But fishing is not just about the carbon. For sure, carbon is, is very important. But fishing is also about the environment and the structure of the environment. And one of the um, policy planks, if you like, of the Green Deal is the new biodiversity strategy and its particular targets for resource conservation and ecosystem protection, which envisages that the bottom impacting gears will be reduced over time. And the Commission, European Commission, is due to come up with an action plan on how they're going to achieve the various targets they've set themselves to reduce these bottom impacts. There also need to be some key policy and regulatory changes that LIFE is um, lobbying for. And as I mentioned earlier, what we're really calling for is a differentiated approach to inshore fishing and to offshore fishing. So we need a differentiated approach for smaller scale, lower impact fishing in order to enable the small scale fishers and the communities which depend on their catches to be able to access fairly the fishing resources on which they depend and to be able to sell their products in ways that add value to them. And we want to protect the fishing areas from uh, larger scale activities which they're currently not protected from. We also want to see a change in the way the food system operates. We would like to see a lot more um, decentralization and local emphasis put on the way that food is produced and consumed so that you have a much closer um, connection between producers on the one hand and consumers on the other and moving towards what we would call community supported fisheries where consumers and producers share the same basic value of wanting something that is produced fairly, something that is produced sustainably, something that um, corresponds to very high qualities of freshness and food safety, and something for which the consumers are prepared to pay a little bit more of. That means that in the future, we may have to consider that we will have to eat rather less fish and maybe pay rather more from it. And that if we want- Brian, I'm so sorry, could you wrap up now, low please? Yeah. If we want to have the luxury of having the low cost fish, which is produced by the trawler fleet or the larger scale fleet on our supermarket shelves, then we may have to look at other more novel products like single cell protein produced from the sea, uh, seaweeds, but fish is a high right. quality okay. product. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. It was a really clear um, explanation of some of the, the more European and the policy issues that affect the systems there. Um, so a really helpful kind of next step up from hearing the Scottish context. So we're gonna scale up one more time. So we're gonna go to West Africa um, and we've got a pre-recorded presentation from Monsieur Gasso Goyer. I'm going to say that wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, he is the president of CALPA, which is the African Confederation of Artisanal Fisheries Organizations. Um, and he's based in Senegal. So we have a recorded presentation and he will be joining us um, for the Q&A. And that's 
um, why we have the translation feature. So his presentation is in French, but with English subtitles. Merci encore de nous avoir donné la parole. Donc, je vais lire la déclaration de la COPA sur le salutage de fond sur les côtes africaines. La côte africaine, notre maison, notre lieu de travail, notre garde-manger est en péril. Le changement climatique créé par les activités des pays industrialisés hérite aujourd'hui les zones côtières et emporte nos maisons. Le changement climatique provoque des tempêtes plus nombreuses qui font courir toujours plus de risques à nos pêcheurs. Les femmes transformatrices de poissons reviennent plus souvent de la plage avec le panier vide. Les poissons sont chaque jour moins nombreux, toujours plus petits et toujours plus chers. Le poisson, qui depuis toujours est notre filet de sécurité alimentaire, disparaît de l'assiette du consommateur africain. Mais si le poisson disparaît, c'est aussi à cause de la surpêche et des pratiques de pêche destructrices comme le salutage de fond dans les eaux côtières africaines. Les scientifiques nous disent que le salutage de fond réduit la productivité des fonds marins, conduit à une perte d'habitat halieutique essentielle et perturbe la structure et le fonctionnement des écosystèmes. Les scientifiques nous le disent, mais nous, pêcheurs artisans africains, nous voyons tous les jours les dégâts des chalupiers de fonds industriels dans nos zones de pêche. Dans certains pays africains, nous voyons même des chalupiers toutes les nuits venir pêcher illégalement tout feu éteint à quelques milles des plages. Les communautés de pêcheurs artisans du Congo, du Sénégal, du Kenya, à Madagascar, dénonce amèrement des collisions quotidiennes, parfois meurtrières, avec des chalutiers qui pêchent illégalement dans la zone réservée à la pêche artisanale. Les engins lourds déployés par ces bateaux détruisent les filets des pêcheurs artisans et les propriétaires acceptent rarement de les indemniser. Personnellement, je ne connais aucun chalutier de fonds industriel qui a été construit dans un pays tropical africain. Tous les chalutiers que nous voyons dans nos eaux viennent de la Chine, de la Russie, d'Europe, de Corée. Ils rentrent dans nos eaux côtières, réputées riches en poissons grâce à de différents arrangements avec nos autorités. Des affrètements, des repavillonnements de façades à travers des sociétés mixtes ou encore des accords de pêche. Sauf exception. Les communautés de pêche artisanale africaines qui dépendent de la pêche pour vivre ne sont jamais consultées, ni même informées par nos dirigeants avant de faire venir ces bateaux qui souvent ne respectent pas les règles. Au Libéria, des chalutiers espagnols repavillonnés au Sénégal pillent les ressources de crevettes profondes dans la zone de pêche artisanale, sous le prétexte d'une pêche expérimentale. Au Sénégal, les chalutiers d'origine étrangère repavillonnés refusent systématiquement d'embarquer un observateur à bord. En Côte d'Ivoire, la plupart des chalutiers côtiers nationaux sont d'origine chinoise, pavillonnés ou affrétés localement. Ces chalutiers pêchent de façon non sélective, détruisent l'environnement côtier fragile, ne respectent pas les périodes de repos biologiques et maltraitent leur équipage. Au non-respect de la nature se joint le non-respect des êtres humains. Aujourd'hui, nos communautés de pêche artisanale africaines se battent pour leur survie. Non seulement nous devons faire face à la crise provoquée par la COVID-19 et les restrictions qui ont été prises, mais nous devons aussi faire face aux conséquences sur nos océans des catastrophes provoquées par la cumulité de l'être humain que ce soit la surpêche, les impacts du changement climatique ou encore l'exploitation pétrolière offshore. Nous survivons à tout cela, nous adopterons nos maisons, nos saisons de pêche, notre mode de vie. En 2022, c'est l'année internationale de la pêche et de l'aquaculture artisanale. Décrétée par les Nations Unies, ce sera l'occasion pour nous que nos décideurs montrent ils ont pris pleinement conscience de l'importance de la pêche artisanale pour l'emploi, la sécurité alimentaire, le maintien des communautés côtières dynamiques imprégnées de la culture des gens de main. L'une des priorités de l'organisation que je préside, la Confédération africaine des organisations professionnelles de la pêche artisanale, euh, la CAOPA, c'est de demander à nos gouvernements des droits exclusifs d'accès à la zone côtière 
pour la pêche artisanale africaine dans les pays côtiers africains. Cela signifie faire sortir tous les chalutiers de la zone côtière. Nous voulons également que l'entièreté de cette zone côtière soit gérée avec les communautés de pêcheurs. L'écosystème côtier est notre maison. Qui peut mieux que nous pour garder cette maison en bon état avec de bons outils Un de ces outils, c'est la surveillance participative. Il y a quelques années en Guinée, les pêcheurs avaient détecté plus de 400 incursions illégales de chalutiers dans leur zone de pêche. 12 pêcheurs avaient été blessés, perdus en mer ou décédés. Des patrouilleurs de surveillance par les pêcheurs artisans dans la zone ont permis de diminuer par 4 le nombre d'infractions enregistrées. Un autre de ces outils, ce sont des aires marines protégées. Mais seulement si elles sont mises en place et gérées par les communautés locales et qu'elles s'inscrivent dans une dynamique de co-gestion de la zone côtière par les communautés de pêcheurs. Nous ne voulons plus dans cette zone côtière de pratiques de pêche qui détruisent les écosystèmes côtiers fragiles dont nous dépendons pour vivre. Un chalutier de fonds industriel qui pêche à quelques milles de la côte dans un pays tropical africain, c'est un éléphant dans un magasin de porcelaine. Nous ne pouvons plus accepter. Je vous remercie. So much, um, Monsieur Gasso. Um, so now we're going to move um, into the Q&A section. Um, we have got quite a number of questions coming in online. Um, and obviously, it'd be great to hear from you guys in the room as well. So please take a few moments to think of questions. Um, we just need to do a bit of tech in the background. Um, so there's going to be a short animation about the, the work of life um, just when we move over platforms. So we have a few minutes animation, and then we'll jump straight into the Q&A. Small-scale fishers have been the backbone of coastal communities across Europe for thousands of years. They normally do short trips, landing the freshest fish possible on a daily basis. Many of them are family businesses with the owner on board, following fishing traditions that care for the catch and the wider marine environment. Globalization has increased the demand for fish, putting strain on supply chains and fish stocks around the world. With some parts of the fishing industry historically taking too many fish too quickly, leading to some species dropping to dangerously low levels. This is no good for fish, fishermen, or the millions of people who rely on fish as an important part of their diet. Small scale fishers are not the ones responsible for this overfishing because they commonly use the right gear in the right place at the right time. They are the stewards of the sea, not pirates. But instead of being rewarded for their sustainable approach, they get only a very small share of the fishing rights and have often been excluded from the decision-making process. Although no one can own the fish in the sea, fishing rights are increasingly being put up for sale to the highest bidder, often devastating coastal communities and leaving smaller scale fishers without access to the fish on their doorstep. But things are changing. The LIFE platform has been established as a single, strong and inclusive voice to represent the interests of and champion small-scale, low-impact fishermen and women across Europe. We encourage and support our members to fish in a sustainable way using low-impact fishing techniques, meaning less discard and ensuring new generations of fish can thrive. And with four out of five boats in Europe being classed as small-scale, we have strength in numbers as well as unity. By working together with our member organizations, LIFE is able to develop common solutions to common problems, calling on the massive talent and combined experience of thousands of fishers across Europe. With recognition, support and fair access to resources, the smaller scale, low impact fishers of Europe can be the solution to many of the problems facing the marine environment today. At LIFE, we want to be a gateway for a new generation of young fishers while preserving our traditional methods and values, ensuring a bright future for fishers and the sea through sustainable fishing. Everybody, um, bit of a tech transition, hopefully online you're, you're in the right place now for the Q&A um, and for those of you that are in the room, it'd be great um, to hear your questions. We've got a couple of additional panelists joining us for the Q&A. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce Beatrice Gores. 
Um, she is the spokesperson and coordinator of the Coalition for Fair Fisheries Arrangements. And actually, I can see a question in the chat here that kind of speak to some of the issues that um, Beatrice um, deals with. So Beatrice, if you'd like to um, come online, and I'm taking my kind of moderator's prerogative, um, if you could tell us a little bit um, about the CFFA's perspective on bottom trawling. Right, do you hear me? Because I can't see whether I'm connected or not. Do you hear me okay? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, merci, Gamsou. <laughs> so, yes, um, I've been coordinating the Coalition for Fair Fisheries Arrangement for about 25 years now and working with organization of artisanal fishers in Africa. And I must say, a lot of the presentations was very interesting because it really highlights uh, what these fishers are what their daily challenge is when they face uh, trawlers at sea. So as Gaussu was saying, and also the fishers uh, in the beginning of the, of the, uh, of the meeting were, were saying from Belize, um, these trawlers, they have wealth, they have the wrong equipment, and they have power, they have the undue power. Because often it is up to the coastal countries to give licenses to these trawlers, and often they give give these licenses without really thinking through what it means for artisanal fishing. It's a bit different from the situation that was described in Europe, where trawling is still uh, the, the very important for, for supplying the market. If you look at the African market, it's mainly supply fast by small-scale fishing. So there is there a competition between the product of small-scale fishing, which goes mainly to the local, national, regional markets, and the product that are caught by trawlers, mostly of foreign origin, that will go for export. So you there have a competition in the fishing zone, but also you have a competition for the supply of the local market. So there is an impact on food security because of the activities of these trawlers. So what we want for the future, and I refer a bit to the, uh, to the ask of the, uh, of the coalition, yes, we do want artisanal fishing zone to be established, but also we want these zones to be managed by the fishers, by the fishing communities, because as Gaussu was saying, they are the best ones to know what needs to be done in the coastal, uh, coastal area. So we do want artisanal fishing zones, but we want them being co-managed, being under the control of artisanal fishing communities. Secondly, when it comes to trawling, um, yes, we agree that we should stop funding trawling, but also, I think that rather than providing uh, funding for changing them or transforming them, the most important thing is to provide funding and support, technical support, financial support, to the existing low-impact fishing, to the existing artel fishing communities, which are facing very difficult challenges today. Uh, I know you are in Glasgow, and you are in Glasgow because there is this international attention on, on global warming and climate change. And as we have shown in a report we recently produced, artisanal fishing communities in Africa are the first ones, are the first victim of the global warming. So to build the resilience of these communities, it is very important. A very important aspect will be to protect their access to resources in the coastal zone. So that's why we feel that trawling has not its place, has no place in artisanal fishing zone in Africa, has no place along the coast of Africa. Thank you very much. It's really succinct um, and impactful addition. Thank you. But I'd like to go to the room. If anybody has any burning questions that they would like to raise to any of our panelists or all of our <laughs> panelists, um, please raise your hands. No, nobody wants to talk. I'll jump to the. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, yeah, of course. Um, thanks for organizing this event. Uh, great to be here. Hello to everyone online. I'm Callum Duncan, Marine Conservation Society. Um, it's obviously a very international event, but just for a quick Scotland focused question what's your position on the, the sort of outcome from the Scottish Government, Scottish Green Agreement on sort of capping inshore fishing and then? Uh, committing to finish um, sort of MPA measures and finish the work to um, uh, complete the protection for vulnerable 
priority features. Uh, full disclosure here, we we actually responded to a process, that, you know, being sympathetic to the idea of um, pushing trolley and dredging out. Um, and uh, I think it's, you know, it's reasonably positive that at least there's a cap to work back from. I just wondered if there was any perspectives on that. Go ahead. Um, I was uh, meeting recently with Marie Goujon, who's the Scottish Fisheries Minister, and I asked her what, what was meant by a cap on issue of fishing. Was it capping horsepower days at sea? Was it capping particular gear types? And she couldn't answer that question. So it's very hard to know what's going to come of that when the Fisheries Minister herself doesn't really know what was meant by that particular element in the deal. As for the prior, priority marine features review element of, of your question, I think um, what I was saying in my talk was that the prior main features review, if it was done correctly, um, if Marine Scotland did what they committed to do in 2010 and protect and recover our priority main features and did it on the historic pre trawl baselines, there would be an inshore limit, effectively. I mean, if they did the job properly, there would be a coastal prohibit prohibition on trawling and dredging right around the coast of Scotland. And in some areas, that might not be quite three miles. In other areas, it might be more than three miles. Scottish Kill Fishermen's Federation have been arguing for a three mile limit, at least on the west coast mainland, for some time. And I think anything which gives us a coastal limit where we give preferential access to low impact fisheries would be a step in the right direction. I think in the longer run, low impact fisheries have got to have preferential access to fishing opportunity wherever they can be, be facilitated. So the, you, know, you shouldn't have anywhere where a scalp dredger can, can displace a scalp diver, for example, or where a, where a prawn trawler can displace a prawn trailer. In, in the first instance, these have lower environmental impacts, but they also have higher economic returns from the resources that are extracted. So they support the fishing industry better, they support the coastal communities better. And so this idea that somehow some big boat can come in, displace some small boat, um, and, and everything's fair. It's not fair, it's not reasonable, it's not a good societal benefit, it's not a good ecological benefit, it's not a good economic benefit. So I mean, if the Scottish government do the job right, we will have this inshore coastal limit by whatever name they want to call it. Great. Thank you. I'm going to jump to um, one of the questions um, online now. Um, um, so it's a question um, to Brian, please. Um, do you think that small scale methods could meet the market demand if bottom trawled gear was banned? Thank you for the question. Um, when you talk about market demand, it depends what market demand you're talking about. Small scale, uh, low impact activities could certainly meet the market demand for their products, which are value added, locally produced, uh, linked to local markets, rather than mass uh, markets through the supermarket shelves. If you want to have mass uh, supply, of say frozen fillets, um, then small scale low impact fishing is not, not, not what you're looking for. But I think the question really answers itself. Quite clearly the market demand that we have at the mo moment and the expectations of what fish can be for consumers is completely um, misplaced. If we want to benefit from food from the sea on a massive scale, we're going to need to develop more innovative techniques for producing that fish. I'm not talking about aquaculture as such, but talking about using the production lower down the ecosystem at the primary level, um, trying to use plankton or single cell um, algae to produce protein or seaweeds, but we can't think in the future that we're going to be able to meet the market demand for frozen fillets from a low impact fishery because the production simply isn't enough. What the low impact can produce is a much higher quality product um, at, at a local level through a different supply and value chain system. Um, we're going to need to change our food production systems. I think the COVID pandemic has highlighted just how vulnerable our food systems are. And we can see currently with Brexit and the return to um, large uh, global demands, how vulnerable our supply chains are. Now, 
small scale fisheries are not part of those supply chains. They depend on completely different supply chains, which are far more local. So that's where we're going to have to look. And to deal with the market demand, we're going to have to change our larger food system. Thank you. Um, we come back into the room if anyone, did you have a uh, question? Yeah, kind of. One second, you just need the mic, there we go. Hi, um, is it on? Uh, Mike Walker from Our Fish. Just maybe two questions. One is around the subsidies that, as you pointed out, that uh, removing uh, subsidies, particularly fuel subsidies, would kind of end uh, bottom and, and dredging overnight. Uh, so what what are you, what are you doing to to realize that? Because there's a WTO process, there's an EU process, um, and then maybe just even on the bottom, the MPA issue. It's curious. We heard about the importance and the value of the the, the, the actual marine ecosystem itself, which of course is the entire water column. So, in marine protected areas, there's an abundance of evidence that the benefits, the greater the level of protection, the greater the benefit, not just to the ecosystem, but also to um, fisheries adjacent to those areas. So why only a ban and bottom phone? Is that not an incredibly, excuse the perhaps pun, low bar, or potentially even too low, given the need and urgency for a restoration of, of ecosystems, including marine ecosystems? Yeah, great, right. quest great questions. Um, I'll come to Beatrice, if I may, on the subsidy question, if you're online. So um, how, what are we doing to go about um, reducing or yes. banning? Subsidies for bottom trawled boats. Yes, I can. I can only speak a bit about the European type of subsidies because, uh, first of all, subsidies generally are very opaque. So it's very. I see there. Are, I know there are big numbers floating around, but it's very difficult to know how much public money a uh, a particular vessel uh, receives. So I would only talk about uh, the, the Europeans, and I would say the European trawlers. Fishing in Africa, for example, they receive different kinds of subsidies. Not only will they benefit from the fuel tax exemption, but also they receive money uh, uh, helping them to access third country waters to what is called uh, bilateral fishing access agreements. So one of our uh, demand for years has been that in these access agreements, which have their uh, advantages because it provides a transparent uh, legal framework, but within that framework, all the vessels should pay 100% of their access cost, which is not the case for the moment. We have, for example, uh, shrimp trawlers in Mauritania. When they, they, when you look at how much they catch, they pay more or less half a euro per uh, ton of shrimp caught or per ton of, of, uh, of, of production. When they make a lot of money uh, from from what they from what they catch, so sorry, uh, half a euro the kilo. Excuse me. So I think this is made uh, possible because they receive uh, all this uh, public money through access agreements and also because they benefit from the fuel tax exemption. So, yes, indeed, the current discussion about removing fuel tax exemption is very important in that, uh, in that regard. But when it comes to uh, uh, distant water vessels, they generally don't refuel in Europe, so that won't affect them so much. So I think the, the important thing is to have them paying 100% of their cost and making sure they are kept out of the coastal zone where artificial fishers uh, do operate and where ecosystems in Africa are incredibly fragile, like they are in Europe, as we've seen in Europe. And I can maybe just touch on, um, I guess, as, a, as one of the calls to actions for the Transform Bottom Coalition, there will be an action planning process in the next probably six six to eight months um, where we'll come together as a coalition and maybe beyond that <coughs> to try and understand what the next steps might be in terms of as a, as a coalition, how can we engage on that issue? So a bit of a watch watch this space. Um, can I come to Jenny on the MPA question? So is stopping bottom trawling enough? Um, not just bottom trawling. I mean, we'd like to see scallop dredging included. So bottom contact, mobile fishing um, in our inshore waters band. Um, obviously, the 1984 three-mile limit that was, repe that was repealed in 1984 only banned um, bottom trawling, but we would like to see a modern inshore limit that, in that included um, scallop dredging as well, because as we know, that has equally is um, impactful. It's an impactful method on our seabed and, as you say, the bottom of the food chain, which impacts the full marine ecosystem. And um, I think it's what Bally was saying as well. It's not necessarily a three-mile ban in 
blanket ban around Scottish um, inshore waters. It, it might vary. It might be three miles in some areas and, and six miles in others. Um, but certainly bottom contact mobile fishing rather than just trawling, for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to an online question, if I may. <coughs> so this was submitted by Kenny Cool of the Scottish White Fish Producers Association. Um, and the question is, do you believe that there is enough evidence available on the impact of trawling on carbon stores, including the rate of resettlement of carbon after trawling? Sally, would you fancy that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, um, and it's quite interesting because I'm only learning about carbon in, in, in recent times. I was uh, convinced that bottom trawling should be phased out inshore in preference for low impact fisheries before I heard anything about carbon. So I think there's, a, there's very compelling evidence that we should be transitioning to low impact fisheries. And, and for me, the carbon... Yeah. It's just the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, as it were. I mean, we can, we can, we can debate exactly what the figures are, and I think Kenny's right that you know we have to we have to research this more, and we have to create a, a better, stronger evidence base so that we're making sure that we're we're acting on the right things, the right the right place at the right time. But really, I think the evidence is already very compelling, social, economic, and environmental that we have to phase out bottom toad gear inshore, especially where we have an alternative. And I think that's worth em emphasising. I know the other gentleman here mentioned, you know, what about other fisheries? There are alternative fisheries to trawling and dredging inshore that are higher employment and, and lower environmental impact. And I think um, I think we have to focus on them. And they need management too. I mean, they are not immune to management. There is no such thing as a sustainable fishery without proper management. And I think that's worth emphasizing. Great, thank you. Um, I think there was one more question in the room. Hi, I'm uh, Monica Verbeek from Seas at Risk. Um, perhaps rather, uh, call to action rather than a, than a question. I just want to highlight that, uh, at least for the European context right now, there is uh, a consultation out right now to uh, um, uh, for the action plan that was mentioned in, uh, in the presentations, an action plan of the European Commission that will address uh, impacts of fisheries on marine ecosystems. I think it's very important that they hear a very loud and clear call from wide and afar from all over Europe that bottom trawling should not be a part of uh, the future of European fisheries. So I would call on you all to go and, and answer on that um, con uh, consultation on the action plan on the European Commission. Okay, great, thank you. I don't know if we're able to find the, or if you can share a link or something to that, we can circulate it after the event, I'm sure. Um, given where we are, COP26, um, I'd like to go to Monsieur Gousseau and ask him um, if he could speak to the decision makers that are in the room negotiating here in Glasgow, what would be his key message to them in terms of fisheries impacts and bottom trawling? Merci d'ailleurs de nous avoir permis de participer à ce panel. Le gros message que je vais dire, ça ne sortira pas de ce que j'ai dit déjà dans la déclaration de la CAOPA. Et nous tous, nous savons que le salutage a un impact vraiment négatif sur les écosystèmes, sur nos océans. Et ce pas des pratiques de pêche qui, qui ne sont pas du tout bonnes. Et aujourd'hui, c'est pour cela que nous avons demandé et nous continuerons à demander avec insistance pour qu'il y ait une zone réservée pour la pêche artisanale. Parce que, par exemple, si je prends l'exemple du pirogue au Sénégal ou en Afrique de l'Ouest qui pêche la sardinelle, il y a au moins pour une seule pirogue 100 personnes qui en dépendent. Depuis le charpentier jusqu'au pêcheur, Jusqu'à consommateur, il y a à peu près 100 personnes qui dépendent. Et ils font des pratiques de pêche qui sont vraiment nobles. Mais quand même, il faudra continuer à encadrer, à les conscientiser pour qu'ils qu comprennent que les océans, la pêche artisanale, c'est leur devenir, c'est leur propriété, c'est leur maison. C'est eux qui doivent être en première ligne pour la préserver. Mais il faudrait également qu'il y ait des politiques adaptées et participatives et qui permettent aux citoyens, à la société civile, aux pêcheurs, aux communautés côtières de faire valoir leur connaissance et leur donner la possibilité d'échanger avec eux 
sur euh, ce qui se passe dans les océans et dans nos mers parce qu'ils le connaissent très bien. Et comme j'ai dit, et les charifiés nous viennent sur des accords de pêche, sur des sociétés mixtes, avec d'autres administrations ou bien des décideurs qui n'essaient même pas de comprendre ce qui se passe en mer. Et qu'aujourd'hui, il est grand temps que les gens se comprennent qu'avant de prendre des décisions, il faut avoir connaissance de ce qui se passe dans le milieu marin. Et faire surtout confiance aux chercheurs et les coupler avec la recherche des connaissances empiriques. En tout cas, je vous remercie encore une fois plus. Et quand même, il y a un autre donne, c'est on a parlé des aires marines protégées, mais il y a un autre impact, c'est les déchets plastiques qui vont impacter beaucoup les tortues marines qui vont les confondre à des méduses pour les manger et qui n'est pas bon pour leur santé. Je vous remercie. <laughs> um... <laughs> Um, so just, um, I think we've got time for maybe one final question, and I'm just very conscious that we also have Davy Stinson on the line with us. I've got a question. For him. Okay, perfect. Um, so just, to, I mean, he could introduce himself, um, but he is another um, Scottish fisherman, um, and he's a scallop diver. So, yeah, please go so, ahead with your question. So um, the question is, uh, what can we learn from Norway in terms of the job creation from banning uh, bottom trawling? in Norway after the banning of bottom trawling? <laughs> oh, can you unmute yourself, please, Davy? <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, right. Um, the, um, the, they, they banned uh, in, uh, bottom trolling in the inshore waters some, some decades ago, um, apart from there's a small area in the Skagerrak which is fished mutually by the Swedes, the Danes and the Norwegians for necrops. Otherwise, they fish further offshore for shrimp. Apart from that, there is no bottom trawling allowed, certainly not for fish. There's no bottom impacting fishery in the inshore waters. And for example, for scallops, the only licensed and legal way that you can actually fish and harvest scallops is by divers. Uh, so they, they have a an absolutely uh, vibrant inshore fishery industry using uh, sometimes quite old-fashioned fishing methods and uh, the majority of the fleet will fish for with long lines or with trammel nets, uh, gill nets if you like, um, but they have some methods like uh, it's like an underwater fight net which they catch live cod in and they keep them live on board and sell into a live market just to add value to the fish. Um, and there's lots of uh, other things like uh, jigging that goes on. They still ring net for herring. There's quite a bit of pelagic and, and that's conducted in a very managed way. And it's been so successful the way that they've managed their industry that the fishermen there are extremely keen to follow the rules because they understand that that puts money in their bank account. Quite frankly, um, the last time I was out there is about uh, two and a half years ago, and I was only there for a few weeks. Although I have lived in Norway for over a period of years, uh, and I was on a little island called Nesoya, which is right on the Arctic Circle, just south of the Foot Islands. And there's a population; it, it's quite isolated. Is Nesoya? There's a population of 150, uh, of of whom 20 are directly employed on fishing boats. And there's a, obviously a few other jobs in the community to do with the fishing industry. So that whole community is sustained by fishing. 
and they they're really keen to do it in a very sustainable way uh, a lot of people might be worried about gill netting and trammel nets um, I, I was told something that absolutely perfectly illustrates the difference in attitude by the authorities there if you as a fisherman lose your gear if you lose a, a, a gill net on the seabed if it gets stuck and tangled you immediately call the fisheries and they send a boat along to recover it they, they'll they'll drag for it and until they recover it and there's absolutely no penalty to the fisherman for, for losing his gear um, so that everybody help you know is, is, is keen to keep uh, a very sustainable and environmentally friendly fishing industry going they also do not leave gear out they will set their gill nets in the morning and then after they've set however many nets they'll start at the beginning and bring them all on board again with the fish which is not badly then damaged by being left in the nets and they take their gear home with them until they go out to fish again thank you for that um, and I think that's that's largely all we have time for today. I think I hope you agree it's been a really interesting discussion. There's been some really pertinent points made. Um, I'd like to just put a call out as a final call to action to please, um, and there should be some links, I think, jumped into the chat for those of you that are online. Um, have a look at the Transform Bottom Trawling website. Um, please do consider joining um, if your organization um, would be interested to do that. Please also check out the RC's petition um, that Bally and Jenny both referenced, so calling for Scotland to reinstate uh, the three mile inshore limit. Um, and, that, and that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much to everybody that's taken the time to present to us today. It's been really fascinating, some really emotive points coming out um, and a really <coughs> clear understanding of what the issues are around bottom trawling. Those of you online will be taken magic away into breakout rooms that somebody else will be facilitating. And those of us in the room, we can have a drink. So thank you very much for joining us.